afternoon, 4 p.m. in Berlin, and at Space Café Web Talk time, our Space Café 33 minutes with Dr. Josef Aschbacher and a very special guest will begin very soon. We will talk about the ambitions for the future of Europe in space and the Agenda 2025. And we do this live here in Berlin from the Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Climate Action. Today, we celebrate our 100th Space Café. This is a weekly program, and so you can calculate very easily that it has been very exciting two years for us already. As always, we appreciate your participation and your ongoing feedback. Spacewatch.global is a Europe-based online platform for information in and about space and new space activities in a geopolitical context. I would like to thank all of our private and corporate supporters that showed their commitment to keeping our independent journalism alive. We really appreciate that. I know many of you are already familiar with our website, our bi-weekly and daily newsletters and the Space Cafe podcast. The latest one featured Hans-Jörg Ditters about Europe's role in space, and it's a very honest discussion. Just give it a listen. For all our fans of audio content, we have new episodes in the Space Cafe radio as well for you. We also keep our fan shop open online for you to support us actively to become a space watcher. If you've missed any of our previous web talks, we have an archive available on our website in the event section and on YouTube. I have the great pleasure today talking with Dr. Josef Aschbacher, the Director General of the European Space Agency, ESA, and to follow up on our Space Cafe radio that we produced in Brussels earlier in January this year. Due to his schedule today, we had to pre-record this conversation, but we will be live interacting with you on the Q&A. We also have a very special guest who came with Josef Aschbacher today, and that's Dr. Alexander Gerst. Uh, very warm welcome, Dr. Josef Aschbacher and Dr. Alexander Gerst. Last week, our uh, ESA ruling council met in Paris, and you had to make really tough decisions, ExoMars, Galileo, ISS. And now your teams are working on alternatives. So what can be the way forward? So what can be the way forward? So first of all, yes, we had to make, uh, this was a decision of member states uh, to decide how do we proceed with ExoMars. The decision was made that we are not launching this year with uh, Russia. That means uh, we need to find other solutions. And this is also part of the decision that member states asked me to now study uh, how can we go forward. There are basically two options. Uh, one is that we find a purely European solution, that all the components that are included either in the, uh, in the rover, in the lander or in the carrier vehicle are uh, replaced, the Russian parts are replaced by European ones, and or uh, we work with our American friends uh, uh, who are also offered to study uh, what could be eventually done together. So this is now taking place in the next couple of weeks and I plan to come back to my member states uh, before the summer break uh, with uh, all the elements uh, that we need to have in order to make a decision how to move forward with ExoMars. But yes, I, I do agree it's a tough decision, uh, especially also in view of all the engineers and the scientists who have been working on this for decades. Uh, the uh, rover is almost on the launch pad and we cannot launch it and that's tough. Uh, and that's something that uh, is a reality, but there's no choice uh, in today's geopolitical situation, but also the sanctions which have been imposed on Russia. We practically cannot launch uh, ExoMars now with Russia because of the sanctions, but also for political reasons, it's uh, a no-go, which uh, is very clear. I mean, that was also part of the decisions last week. Alex? Yeah, the ISS uh, member states uh, including the ESA member states have decided to uh, go forward with the ISS operations to continue them. Um, that is, uh, of course, for one reason to ensure that uh, the astronauts and cosmonauts, it's the same work, right? Uh, they're all up there and they need to be safe. So that's one, one of the reasons. And the other reason is that uh, there's big problems uh, to solve for us as a society on Earth. We have uh, climate change, we have an ongoing pandemic, there's diseases, there's uh, uh, wars, there's unequal distribution of, of property in the world. There's uh, part of the solutions uh, for these uh, problems, they come from the cooperation on the space station. And uh, so the member states have decided to go forward with uh, continuing uh, the cooperation. 
So the crews up there are working, they are doing science experiments uh, as well as they can. So uh, that is the situation right now. We are speaking here in Berlin. Our um, your colleague um, Matthias Maurer is preparing or is doing his, his spacewalk, is it correct? Yes, he will do a, a spacewalk tomorrow with okay. an American uh, colleague. They will uh, be uh, out and about on the space station. They will uh, do a maintenance task on uh, the cooling system of the uh, ISS and then they will also uh, work on the European Columbus module on the outside. They will um, uh, finalize the, uh, the European uh, product uh, of the Bartolomeo platform, making sure that this works uh, well, uh, being ready for future uh, science experiments on the outside of the space station. So yes, he will be very busy today preparing his suit, his, his tools that's uh, all probably already prepared, but he will go through the checklist. He will have to remember 500 uh, different steps of a, of a checklist of what they're going to do. How does it feel a day before going out into space? I mean, you, you've been there, you've done a check, so, but I think it's not this check. No, you're absolutely right. It's, uh, it's not, uh, it's not a, a, a routine situation at all. Uh, of course, he has trained for this many, many times, uh, many hundred hours uh, in the spacesuit underwater of training. So the task itself will be actually the easiest for him to do. Yeah, but you're right, it's a, it's a long preparation. So uh, the road to EVA, as we lead it, as we call it, um, is about two weeks long. So every day you have uh, hours and hours of tasks of preparing the suit, preparing your tools, preparing the, the procedure that you do outside. And so that is really something that is on your mind because you know uh, you don't want to make a mistake that endangers maybe the success of a science experiment or the functionality of the space station. So it is really out of the question for us that uh, we do a mistake. So that's why we need to be prepared so well and we go through procedures again and again. We do checks of our tools again and again. Check that all the tethers are in place, that the parameters of the suits are in place. And so yes, the day before your, your, your brain is constantly checking, oh did I think of this, did I think of that? And of course, yeah, you will be in that state. But of course, also, um, as you said, it, it's an amazing thing to do. To, uh, to go outside the space station, to be basically a satellite of your own. You're, you're, you're following a, a, your own trajectory around Earth and you know, there's nothing holding you, nothing in between you, 400 kilometers and the surface of the Earth. Uh, knowing that you have a three millimeter thick uh, visor that protects you from this. It's an amazing thing, but of course it's teamwork as always. Um, hundreds, if not thousands people involved in this. And I think you can't better phrase it than being in your own orbit in that, in that situation. Coming back to, to Europe and the ESA. Josef, how far can ESA as a civil organization in this current situation where we are in play a role in securing Europe? Yeah. yeah. No, Europe can, uh, but uh, just uh, listening to, to Alexander um, describing this uh, fascination of, uh, of a spacewalk or of being an astronaut is just uh, it's just uh, fantastic, uh, but uh, what does it mean for security? And uh, of course, these days security is uh, an extremely important uh, issue, uh, uh, even more urgent than ever. Uh, it was always important, but now it's really becoming so real and so so evident that uh, we have to really look into this. So, what I want to do uh, from the side of the European Space Agency is, together with my member states, uh, look into the package which we propose for the ministerial uh, in November. Uh, it is a very solid package which we have built up over the last 10 years, but now the events of the 24th of February uh, force me uh, to relook into this package and reorient it to make sure that Europe is independent, autonomous and more resilient in space because space is so important for everyday life and I have to make sure that uh, uh, everyday uh, life on Earth based on satellites and space infrastructure is guaranteed and is now independent from Russia possible and to secure a strong space sector. So what I want to do is to reshape this uh, package of, uh, of ESA to make sure that we come out of this terrible crisis stronger, uh, stronger as a continent but also stronger in the space sector. When we talked in January in Brussels in our Space Cafe Radio, we focused on the three accelerators um, you put in the Agenda 2025. So where are we? on the implementation of those. I know it's just 
two months ago and other things happened and I think just this one, but it's, it's so much integral part of your work. So where are we? Well, we have made huge progress actually um, um, on the accelerators because the accelerators, uh, even despite the crisis uh, or because of the crisis of, uh, in the Ukraine, are becoming even more important because they give us more resilience. There are two of them, the one dealing with disasters, uh, rapid and resilient crisis response, the other one uh, protecting our space assets, even more important today than, uh, than one month ago. And yes, we are working uh, um, very intensely on those. We have made quite some progress. We had uh, user workshops uh, organized in uh, January uh, for all three accelerators. Uh, and we are now building up a roadmap, uh, white papers and a roadmap of what they will contain and uh, what the next uh, important steps are. So yes, we make huge progress also internally in ESA. I'm just about to organize a dedicated team for uh, these accelerators. So far we have done it a bit on top of our already busy schedule, but now we'll have dedicated people uh, to work on this because it is uh, so strategic and so important that we really need to uh, make sure that uh, we succeed with this. And uh, there's a lot of work to be done. I don't want to go into it. We have discussed it in, at the last meeting, but uh, just making sure that uh, we work on this within ESA but also with the member states. And this will be the focus of the next uh, year or so in order to bring them forward. Um, question to you. Um, one of the accelerators is the Space for a Green Future. And we are here in the Ministry of um, the Economics and Climate Action. So what, and I know this topic is very important for you and you addressed it before, uh, the, the action that we can take on climate. So how do you see your role in, in that? I mean, outside your astronaut role, or maybe in, including it? Well, I think, to be honest, uh, all of these accelerators and inspirators are very important. I do not want to say one is more important than the other, because uh, all address really important problems that we need to solve. And I, I've talked about this uh, before, right? There's, there's massive problems that we as a society have. And, and we as ESA, we're trying to address uh, the biggest ones uh, to help out where we can. And, and, and you have to say, from space, we can help uh, uh, tremendously from that space perspective. Uh, we have Earth observation satellite that have that see things, uh, important climate variables that the human eye cannot see. Right, uh, more than half of all the climate variables that are important uh, can only be uh, observed from space. Um, and you say it, it's it's the perspective that we can add. And of course, as astronauts, as uh, humans in space, we also have um, a certain important perspective. And it's not necessarily the in the infrared spectrum, knowing exactly the soil moisture and the sea level rise. Uh, that's what we have the data and the scientists for. But we see, you know, the other aspect, the, uh, the fragility of this place down here of uh, how important it is uh, to, to protect Earth. And, you know, the realization, um, if you see a thing from the outside, is that, wow, it's, it's just a little rock and it's surrounded by a lot of nothing. Um, so sometimes we see that people down here um, have, and I understand why, the, the feeling that resources are infinite and that uh, um, we can use them up maybe in a, in a different rate than uh, what they're actually there. I see one of the main tasks where you are perfect fit um, will be is to communicate about that because your voice is heard wherever we are on, on this planet. Uh, I mean, you are one of the envoys of humanity that, that we have and having this outside view, this overview effect, I mean, you experience that and nobody can, can speak about it with full heart than, than you. I mean, not we as journalists, not, not the DG from, from his strategic point of view, but you have been there. Well, I disagree. I think it's important that we all do it because what would be our voice without somebody like you here uh, transporting it? Um, I think it all comes together. None of us is in this alone. We can only uh, make it as a team. And that's what uh, space also teaches us. No nation alone can achieve these things uh, by themselves. That's why we come together and do it together. Are we heading to a truly autonomous Europe right now? Is that on the agenda? And how does the European Union, European Commission also go in that direction? Or mm. Just let me rephrase it. ESA and EU. Are they combining their efforts on this European autonomy? Yeah. 
I mean, there's no choice, especially in crisis, that uh, other than working together closely. And this uh, has already been a, a top priority for me, as you know, in Agenda 2025, uh, that the EU and the European Space Agency are really working hand in hand uh, in order to uh, realign their forces uh, to tackle all the problems we have, uh, climate and, and many others. And now with the crisis, it's even more important because now uh, we can even less uh, afford to not work together. So it's absolutely clear that we have to work together. But the beauty is that uh, the Space Summit in, uh, in February in Toulouse was really uh, making it very clear, expressed by top politicians uh, of the ESA member states, of the EU member states, uh, of uh, the Commissioner Breton, of myself, of uh, President Macron and many others, that uh, ESA and the European Union are working together well and we have programs uh, where this happens. Let me take the accelerators. Uh, we have uh, the accelerator for green future, which also works in implementing the EU Green Deal in order to make sure that we decarbonize our economy faster and we use all the means we have to do that, space included. Uh, space uh, is also for rapid and resilient response necessary and here again the ESA accelerator works hand in hand with the secure connectivity initiative of the European Commission. Another example is uh, the STM, Space Traffic Management uh, uh, communication which was published by the Commission with our Protect uh, Accelerator. Again, these two are complementary and work hand in hand. So yes, absolutely, EU and ESA cooperation has strengthened through the Space Summit and especially now in the, in the face of the crisis uh, we are doing everything to really make this happen and this is what I want to do for the European Space Agency to be sure that we are a strong partner and make space more independent uh, for Europe, for a stronger Europe, uh, not only in space but for its people because space is so essential for all our people. And the one thing that I'd like to add there I, you know, uh, when you ask about autonomy, then we, we should make sure we're talking about the same thing. Autonomy does not mean we do everything on our own. Autonomy is actually an important enabler for international cooperation. That's the thing. If you want to be an attractive partner, if you want to be on the table where the important decisions are made, like in the spacefaring nations, you need to bring something to that table. And uh, it's a little bit paradox, but it's the way it goes, is that if you bring a capability you could do it on your own, you get attractive for the others. And that means you can come to this table in a much stronger position that enables you to do international cooperation later. So autonomy is not doing things on our own. Autonomy is, well, we could do some other things on our own and we need to do that. Otherwise, we're out of the game for um, human spaceflight, for example. That's uh, one of the important topics that we're, we're trying to address to make sure that Everybody understands that the situation has changed. Uh, it's not, it's not going to work in the future like it did in the last two decades. And that means if we want to continue uh, being at the forefront of this important science, especially uh, in Europe, I mean, we're technology nations, right? Uh, also, Germany is very important for us here. Um, that we need to be, if we want to be at the table, we need to be autonomous, more autonomous, meaning we need to be able to do some things on our own that we didn't before. What are the next steps now for preparation of the uh, Ministerial Council in November? So the next steps are, in fact, uh, just last week we, we started what we call the Council Working Group, which is a, a working group of uh, our ESA Council, which meets now every month uh, and we review the package of uh, the ministerial uh, conference uh, uh, proposals. Uh, we have already started working on those about 10 months ago, but now in the light of uh, the Ukrainian war we have to reshape it and reorient it. And uh, every month uh, we will discuss the content and the evolution of it with our member states. But uh, certainly uh, before I go next time to the member states I will do a deep analysis with my directors, with my team, to make sure that what we present to them in a month's time uh, will be already aligned to a new reality which we unfortunately are facing now and therefore making sure that Europe is more resilient, is stronger and more autonomous in space, as Alex is saying, in order to be a strong partner also internationally. We should not forget that uh, strength makes you a strong and attractive partner and that's exactly what we need to do in space and anywhere else, but space certainly is a very good example where this needs to happen. There was some good news last week. Um, you announced the European Center for Space Economy and Commerce in, in Vienna. 
Uh, can you tell us a bit more about it and how does it fit into the commercialization directorate and your entire agenda? Oh, it perfectly fits. Uh, in fact, we created last year a new directorate of commercialization, industrial policy and procurement. And this new center in uh, Vienna actually will be co-hosted at ESPI, uh, which is already uh, uh, well known and well established and works for several decades uh, uh, very successfully. Uh, and yes, it will look into so, uh, economic aspects of space uh, uh, and see how uh, citizens benefit from space in daily life. And this is uh, certainly a focus uh, we want to establish there. Uh, we will have a kickoff of this center uh, on the 4th of July. Uh, and then we start uh, populating it with people and uh, new projects and I'm really looking forward to that. It will be a fantastic event. I hope we will get an invitation for that as well. My last question to you and because I know you, you guys are on a, on, a, on a run here to more meetings. So how do you envision humanity in space in the upcoming decade? I know it sounds like a very trivial question, but in these days I think it gets a special taste. Maybe I start, but then I'm sure the more inspiring version comes from Alex, uh, having been out there. So how do we see uh, exploration in space in the next or in this decade? It's a very, a very interesting uh, point, because if you think backwards, 50 years ago, uh, and then project yourself 50 years into the future, you can see how much can happen in half a century and how much can uh, happen in the future. So certainly, what I would expect is uh, uh, and you can see the seeds already uh, um, uh, developing in different uh, places. Uh, there will be a thriving economy of space on the moon, on the moon's surface. There will be uh, rovers uh, uh, exploring uh, the moon's surface. They probably will make oxygen. They probably will build buildings. Uh, 3D printing will be established there so that uh, we can use the materials on the moon and create uh, uh, yeah, infrastructure. Uh, there will, it will serve as a base for further exploration. Uh, we will, from the Moon, uh, go further out to Mars, obviously, but not only. There will also be other very interesting uh, uh, planets or moons uh, that we want to explore. I have one, I have one very exciting project uh, in the pipeline which we are developing called the Icy Moon uh, mission, which is a mission, and you can hardly imagine uh, this to happen, where we want to launch uh, a spacecraft flying to one of the icy moons of the outer solar system on Jupiter or Saturn, there are several of these moons, Europa, Enceladus, land uh, with the spacecraft, so with a lander on the moon's surface, drill into the surface, take a, a sample of this ice cover, it's an, it's an ice core and underneath we know is water, uh, and take this ice sample back to Earth and analyze it on Earth. You may ask, why do we do that? Uh, but if you ask uh, exobiologists, they would tell you that if you want to look for life in the solar system outside our planet, this is a place to go because there is water underneath, there's an ice cover on top, therefore it's protected, and maybe in this water underneath, which are huge uh, underground lakes, uh, there might be some sorts of life. And of course, what I want to see uh, analyzing this sample is what is this life looking like, if it exists? Does it have a DNA, like mine, like yours, or not? Does it have no DNA? And this, of course, uh, answers huge questions about the origin of life uh, and whether there is other life there or not. And this, you can almost not imagine how fascinating this is, but this is one of the prospects I also would like to explore. And I'm pretty sure within a century this will be happening and this will come. It takes some time from today, but certainly these are the new explorations to come. So yes, there is a lot to be done and very fascinating, but I'm sure Alex has... Uh, That's part of your inspirator. That is one of my inspirators, uh, exactly, uh, in uh, which we have just developed uh, with uh, our member states. Uh, well, it's going to be hard to find a more inspiring <laughs> answer now. I, I uh, <laughs> that was already a, a pretty good. Well, um, I would like to maybe state two things. Uh, one observation is that uh, whatever we did in space in the last uh, decades, uh, we discovered things that we did not imagine. Well, as it is with exploration, that's the way it goes. But it shows that space is massively underused. It's a big black a space out there, there's the entire surface of the moon, there's Earth orbit, there's Mars. We're not using it completely, not even at the tiny fraction of what we should to get all the benefits back that we need. The second thing is, if you take as a projection in the future, say 10,000 10, years in the future, if humanity decides to still exist by then, you look back at the times now, 
what you will remember is probably one big thing, and that is humanity has left the Earth for the very first time. Hundreds of thousands of generations have looked up in the sky, and I'm pretty sure each one here uh, did that. One generation was looking down. So it will, in hindsight, appear as significant as the first fish uh, leaving the ocean to crawl to the continents to discover an entire new world. We're right now way too close to, to really see this because we're, you know, one uh, glimpse of an eye uh, away from this and we can't grasp it yet, I think. And so if we look in the future and project back, I think, you know, that's the important thing that uh, humans will remember from our time. And it will not be remembered which nations, what nationality, the details will not be. It will not be remembered exactly who. That's not important. It is that we as humans decided to take a step out into the unknown. And if you look back uh, how humans have explored continents, for example, we've always stayed. Where we went, we stayed. Antarctica is a good example. Antarctica was once white and empty. People doubted, why do we go there? It's expensive and dangerous. Now we have a scientific bases all over Antarctica. They collect data that literally save the planet because of the knowledge they give us. It will be the same, and I completely agree with you, what, what Joseph has said, exactly the same with Earth orbit, the Moon and Mars. Thank you very much. I don't want to ask any further because I let, let it stay as it is. Thank you, Josef, and thank you, Adit, for this very inspiring talk. I'm afraid we are running out of time. You guys are on a run. And yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great pleasure. Before we finish for today, do not miss our next upcoming events. This week still holds a lot of great sessions. So tomorrow, on the 23rd of March, we have our white label event by the working group for development and humanitarian aid on the topic of Women Speak Up, the impact of COVID-19 on women and girls. On the 23rd and the 24th of March, there's also the Impulse 22, the Space Outreach Conference. On the 24th of March, we have our great Space Law Breakfast by Stephen Freeland on the themes of cooperation and humanity. And on the 25th of March, we have our next Space Cafe Germany, this time hosted by our guest presenter, Markus Moslechner, who will be talking to Dr. Ernst Pfeiffer. And this, of course, will be in German. And then next week, on the 29th of March, we have our next 33 minutes with Laura Ann Edwards. As always, all events are going to be online on Eventbrite. And as always, we would love to hear your feedback. So please check in with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Don't forget to sign up for our daily and bi-weekly newsletters. And if you want to treat yourselves to something special, become a Space Watcher today or help us out in the supporter program. Thank you again to Josef for this inspiring talk and for being our guest. And thanks to the entire team behind the scenes for doing this great job week in and week out. I hope that you all stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you for joining us. I hope to see you all in the next weeks. And in the meantime, visit our website and follow us on social media. And don't forget, become a Space Watcher 